right, um, looks like it is time. And I've got the first item. Um, hey, somebody else did add a second item. That's good. I was going to be the only speaker today. Um, so it's a little too bad that Yob is not going to make it. Um, but based on, well, this was an item that rolled over from last week, um, but it came up a couple of times and it's actually been coming up a lot lately. Uh, the idea of product discovery you know, versus um, whatever it is we call what we do today. Um, I, I've been thinking about how to actually sort of approach this. Um, I was even tempted to sort of just organize a workshop or something where I can just sort of describe what it is that I mean by product discovery at least. Um, I've also been tempted to just sort of do an experiment with a team or two to do a product discovery sprint or more than one or whatever and just sort of slowly introduce it. Um, but what I'll do today is just talk about it meta a little bit, um, what it is, um, why I think it's important for us to understand what product discovery means and why we should consider doing an experiment and then see what you all think um, about, uh, about it and whether we wanna go forward or not. Um, so I did include a link to um, a bad blog post I wrote at some point. Um, it's not very long or detailed, um, but it's the extent of my notes on the subject, unfortunately. Um, this is actually derived very much from work I did at um, Heroku, just to be upfront, um, and how we did product discovery there. And it's a process that we, um, discovered, so to speak, um, sort of accidentally um, from, uh, actually originally it was derived from an interview. Um, at Heroku we did uh, week-long starter projects and um, I basically wanted to give a candidate a, um, yes, we discovered discovery. Um, the reason I say that is because it, it also looks very similar to Lean Startup um, just product discovery, but we didn't know that until after I read the book later, you know, months later. Um, but to be fair, a lot of it was also probably inspired by uh, one of the founders of Heroku who had been mentoring me on stuff and he had gone through YC. So I don't know, there's probably some relationship between YC and Lean Startup. And so it's all related. Um, but the point is, it sounds a lot like Lean Startup, but I didn't actually read the book yet. Um, I have since, and it sounds a lot like it in, after, in retrospect. Anyway, um, the funny thing is that originally the reason I came up with this really compressed kind of schedule was because I wanted to come up with something for a candidate where the work was like nearly guaranteed to succeed. And I was just interviewing the candidate like on what it was like to work with them. And so I came up with this really aggressive thing, like let's make a tiny, tiny little sliver of a feature that we can guarantee we will ship within a week. In fact, to make sure we guarantee we ship it, let's guarantee we ship it in two days. And then we got the rest of the week in case we screw up radically, we can still fix it in three days left. Um, it turned out though, that we actually shipped an amazing amount of stuff in a week. And it was awesome. And it was an eye-opening experience for me, um, which is one of the reasons I want to share it with you guys and girls. I should stop saying guys, sorry. Um, I know you say you don't, but I, I really should stop it anyway. Um, anyway, so, uh, so the idea is um, the, the process we stumbled on, and I should also just be clear too, so we stumbled on it during this one starter project, and then slowly it sort of calcified um, into this process that I'm gonna describe. And it turned out that like any time we ended up challenging the process, we, we basically said, no, this process works exactly as is. Like if, we, if we, there was a challenge, it was an interpretation of how we were supposed to do things, but it was just like the process actually really worked which is also especially funny because we started with this whole thing because our old process wasn't working and we threw out process entirely. And so all of this was generated from scratch from a couple of people who basically said, scrum sucks. All this like planning poker and all these other things are just a total waste of time. Let's throw out all process altogether and let's just talk. And then we ended up coming up with this very rigid process, which is just ironic if nothing else, um, but it really, really works because it, it was based on better principles is the net of it. And I'm not saying Scrum wasn't based on better principles, but it wasn't working for us. Um, so also to give a little bit of just more uh, whatever emphasis on this, it was, um, 
so I was literally working with a team of, I don't remember how many people it was, um, just say five people or something like that. Um, maybe more, eight people. And we were doing Scrum and every sprint, you know, we do a weekly sprint. Every sprint, we try to squeeze out like a few percentages of improvements in our process. But if things were still just horribly bad, um, we spent a whole bunch of time like, okay, let's iterate on making sure that we've got really good high fidelity mockups. So the engineers have something better to work with than the low fidelity mockups. And then we'd still have problems where the engineers would implement something wrong, or whatever. So then we got even higher fidelity mockups. Then we got like, well, let's annotate the mockups with like exact dimensions of things, or let's talk about the things we care about because back then we were using Photoshop too. And so like you have gradients that didn't exactly translate from Photoshop to CSS. And so some people would always interpret things a little bit differently. And one of the struggles was the designer was like, I want to just say like, I don't really care about this. I want it to look like this. Don't follow my Photoshop mockup exactly because it's not CSS. But this one I do care about. Like this really has to be five pixels. Don't make it three or, two or seven, it's gotta be five. And so we ended up like literally mocking this up like an engineering architecture diagram. And we got this really, really rigid thing. So product and design would work really, really closely. And then we'd still throw it over the fence to engineering. And so the best we got to was we would do that. We'd spend a week mocking up something. And then we'd give engineering two weeks before they'd pick it up. And that was based on a recommendation from um, Marty Kagan's book. Um, and then engineering would pick it up and then they'd work on it for a week. And then they'd show it at the end of the week on demo day. And then we'd see it and then be like, okay, well that looks pretty good. And we'd come up with some immediate things, but then after we'd go to use it, we'd come up with more. So we'd come up with all the bug fixes over the next week, we'd feature assurance it as product. And then the following week, engineering would pick up all those bugs and then deliver it. So, you know, net, we're talking about like, I don't know, five weeks of time, calendar time with, with a pretty large team. When we ended up doing this product discovery process, we basically delivered that, that same kind of thing in one week with half the people. And so I roughly speaking say that this was like a 10 X improvement, not in terms of like code lines of code, but in terms of wall clock time of idea of a feature to delivery of a feature one week time. Also, the quality was much better because we didn't have these stupid misinterpretations between engineering and design. Um, and worse is, is the feature assurance part. Like a lot of times, again, you, you design a static mock-up with like the ideal lore mipsum lines of you know, text and you say, okay, let's put three lines of text. And then it turns out that in fact, people don't use three lines of lore mipsum. They use weird bullets and they use 20 lines of text and they use all these other things. And like designing with real data is really, really hard. So a key thing about this is like within 24 hours, we're actually working with real data. We can see whether it really works or not. And we can iterate the next day or the next four hours, in fact, to make changes based on that. Also, I banned Laura Mipsum. Uh, we would never use Laura Mipsum again. Um, I always used at least realistic data, but still that wasn't enough. You had to have actual real data. So anyway, all sorts of things learned. I'm gonna try and speed this up just a little bit. I know we've got an hour, but I don't wanna use up all of it. Um, <laughs> So anyway, the, the idea here, key things are um, product did not fully spec things out before passing it off to the team. Things were just specced enough to know that we could deliver in a week, that it was viable to deliver in a week at least, um, and that it, we had at least some belief that it was an important feature. And we had a hypothesis, you know, that if we, do X, then this will improve something. Um, what we would then do is take that sort of nub of a topic and we do this think big session. And the think big session would literally be a couple of hours long. Um, and we'd really open it up to brainstorming, but also um, there's some subtleties here that it's really hard to express. But um, one of the big things about think big and in, in the brainstorming in general is not the actual brainstorming per se, but it's about getting the whole team on the same page so that all the ideas are now shared instead of having like three different people all have different parts of the stuff in their head and talking about it on an issue where they only talk about like some small intersection, but not really actually being on the same page. And you do the think big session and invariably we found just people were on the same page afterwards, product and engineering and design and everybody knew basically the entire scope of what we could possibly be teaching or talking about here. Also, an important thing about the Think Big was totally disregard um, limitations, like whether something was feasible, whether you could do it in a week or not, even though of course the ultimate goal is to deliver in a week. In the Think Big session, it was like, let's radically rethink everything we could possibly rethink on this topic. 
And I know that's kind of broad and scary, but again, it's only two hours. So, you know, um, but it helped you then open up like ideas that you had never thought about before. Like, uh, I don't know, like, what if we didn't just do this, but what if we threw that whole thing out and did something else instead? And sometimes you ended up being like, yeah, actually that sounds like a really good point. This idea that we thought was really worthwhile actually isn't, let's do something else. Um, it doesn't happen very often, hopefully, but you know, it sometimes does. But more often it's just, it gives you a bigger perspective of what's going on again, being on the same page. Anyway, then a really crucial part was the think small. And this was again, the accidental thing, because I was just trying to make sure that the starter project worked. But we really said like, what can you ship in 24 hours? In practice, we've hardly ever shipped in 24 hours. So it's really more like 48 hours. Um, although at some points we got really good and got it down to 24 hours. But the, the net idea is like, you know, you're starting on a Monday, let's say by Wednesday, you've got the first iteration ready by lunch, you know, Wednesday lunchtime, not Wednesday end of the day. Um, and you've got the first iteration and it's going to be ugly and it's going to be uh, disappointing and it's going to be whatever, but it's going to functionally be there. And I may as well just um, go along with the story now. Uh, this first time we did this, it was, um, we had the Heroku status site told us, told the customers, whatever, whether a Heroku was experiencing an issue or not. Um, and it was all manually entry done kind of stuff. Um, we had completely revved that site. It's now dead. So if you look at it, it's not that site, but it lasted for a good several years. But in the top right hand corner was a little place where we wanted you, well, actually while it was there, it was a place to subscribe to stuff. But before that existed, there was no place to subscribe. The idea was like, we said, okay, if, if Heroku is down, like, it's great that I can discover that there's a problem and then go and check the status site, but why don't you just tell me that the damn thing's down, you know, or even better, you know, like during the command line, tell me if things are out or whatever, but just tell me proactively that something's down instead of uh, warning me, especially since you don't necessarily discover things until your customers are complaining about stuff. And so this was back before any of this stuff was automated. So we said, let's let people subscribe to notifications on the status site. And that was it. Um, and I'll actually, to flesh out the story a little bit more, I went in as product management thinking a couple of things were key. I thought, well, people are going to want to be able to subscribe by email, but they're probably also really going to want to get text messages because um, they're not sitting by the computer all the time. And I want to be alerted in the middle of the night if my critically, you know, awesome, important website is about to go to the VCs and her is down. I need to know about it. So be able to text me, um, maybe even phone me. I don't know. Um, but at least somehow communicate on my device. Um, and then I thought, as a user, you already have my login, so don't make me create a new account, don't make me log in again, uh, or maybe make me log in, but then get my email address from my login. And I thought that was a critical piece. And those are the only things that I really thought about. Beyond that, I said, okay, I don't know what else there is. Awesome thing is, during the Think Small session, one of the developers was like, well, you know, making you log in first and everything else, that's actually really hard. What if we just make you type in your email address again? And I was like, well, that makes no sense. You've already know my email. But it's like, but if I make you log in, you're gonna have to type in your email address anyway to log in. This way, we're at least not asking you to type in a password. Let's just type in your email address. And then I was like, well, how do you unsubscribe? How do I go to my project, you know, my settings to unsubscribe? He's like, well, you get the email. Click on the link to unsubscribe. You don't need an account management system. You just need an email and an unsubscribe mechanism. And that simplification was awesome, came from a developer, scoped it down, which, um, I will honestly say in the entire history of Heroku, we never tied the login systems together. This thing that I as product management thought was critical was not, and in fact made it awesome to not do it. Um, because of course there's this obvious downside of like, if Heroku's down, how the hell do you log in to go and do anything on the status site? That's kind of dumb. Like decoupling these things makes a lot of sense. Um, so anyway, just a good little lesson learned there about like, this is why this stuff's important and why it's important not just to have product involved because product can be dumb sometimes and think that something's important when it's not. Um, so anyway, so think big, think small, you get it down to what can you ship in the next 24 hours, and then you actually go and work on it. Um, and, uh, and again, the first version, we had showed it to a bunch of people, including one of the founders of Heroku, and he was you know, kind of like, yeah, whatever, fine. Um, not the experience we were looking for. We were hoping it would be like, oh yeah, this is cool. I can see that it's ugly, but I can see the potential. It's like, no, whatever, just didn't care. Um, but then we iterated on it. 
And at some point, you know, we, we started off with roughly speaking Rails scaffolding. I don't think it was actually Rails scaffolding. I'm sure it used our own CSS, but it was still roughly speaking scaffolding. And then we said, okay, this, you know, it, it's got to be integrated a little bit better. And so we ended up putting it in the toolbar, or not in the toolbar, there was no part, but we put it in um, the top right hand corner. And so there's a little subscribe link. And uh, we made it all a single form pop up, whatever. So a whole bunch of GUI optimizations, whatever. Um, and we did a whole bunch of other stuff too. So like we actually implemented um, an API on the back end, and we also implemented like you know we had a trigger a Twitter feed with this kind of thing. And so we said like when you go to subscribe, we gave you all these mechanisms. We gave you you can subscribe by subscribe by email, you can subscribe by text message, you can subscribe by um, you know here's the API, so you can do whatever how you want with it. Um, here's the Twitter feed, and then I don't know. There's some. There's five different things you could do. So that was a little bit of scope creep, but it was awesome because we got to it and we said, well, we actually can do these things. Um, we scrambled and made sure that all these things actually work. Um, and then, uh, so we, we did that and basically iterated by the next day, by Thursday, we had this thing that was pretty complete and pretty polished. And then by the time I showed the founders that, they're like, holy crap, this is awesome. Like this is pretty much everything we believe in. And the reason he said that was because we made a bunch of Interesting other choices, like um, when you subscribe by email, you would get all the updates on a message. So you'd get an alert and then you'd also get when you know, the alert was updated and when it was closed and everything else. But if you got a text message, we only alerted you when the thing started. Because again, like, you know, if you're woken up in the middle of the night, it's awesome that you now know Haruku's down, but do you really need to know that, oh, we're still working on it. Like every 10 minutes, you need to stay awake for that. Um, we figured if you got the text message, if you really wanted to, you would then go to your computer and then follow along via email. But, in, but part of the thing is that we had these huge debates about, do we need to let people choose? Because like maybe I do want to know, I want to know when it's closed. I want to know all this. Other. Do we need to give you options and choices? And we said, screw that. No options and choices. Let's just think really hard about what the right answer is. And we will give you that. So you had an option, of course, of email or text, or, but that's it. And then we made the rest of the choices for you. That's one of the reasons that the, the founders really loved it because it was like, we made it really, really simple. Um, so anyway, it, we iterated then by you know, day four, again, uh, Thursday, we had this, we actually launched it to our public, or our beta list, not our public, our private beta list with metrics. Cause we said, okay, what does success look like? And that's the thing I didn't really mention, but in the very first iteration, we even said, what does success look like before we even started coding? And, and we came up with what our metrics were. And we said, well, if 10% of the beta list subscribes and keeps on there and doesn't opt out after they get the first few alerts, then that's success. Um, so anyway, by Thursday afternoon, we had launched it. And, and so we actually had numbers within four hours. We knew how many people subscribed and we got a bunch of feedback and everything else. So by Friday, by the time you know, the starter project was basically done at noon, we already had measured response rates. We knew that 20% of the people had actually signed up and stayed there, um, that this was actually valuable. We had the anic data sort of responses of people saying they loved it, but we had the numbers to back it up. And we had, were fully done. Now there were a few little bugs we fixed over the next week or two, but basically we shipped an entire feature um, from start to end in a week. The reason I really love this and the reason I think we should start caring about this is that um, this is really valuable for high uncertainty projects. Um, we didn't know for sure what, you know, subscription should look like. We didn't know what many of our features at Heroku look, should look like. Um, and we really wanted to get feedback from the beta list early on too. Um, and so part of that was a, you know, a two-way conversation with the beta folks. Whereas currently a lot of things we do is, you know, we, we work on something for a month and then we ship it. And then actually, in fact, we should feature freeze and then wait several weeks before we get any feedback about it. But by then we're already working on the next iteration of it. And so we better be right in some level. I've always said this before though, so speed does sort of solve all our problems. And the thing that GitLab really has going for it is that we ship quickly. And so, yeah, we ship in a month. And even if we're totally wrong, who cares? It's just a month of effort we throw away. More realistically, most of the time we're right and we just need to tweak it, in which case then we'll tweak it really quickly. It still does mean though that calendar time, it can take three months before we actually have a polished version of something. And, um, 
And boy, I'd really love to get that cycle time down, right? This is part of what we pitch, right? We, we pitch our cycle time as meaning something. Um, and it's awesome that we ship in three months. And it's awesome that we ship the sheer quantity of things we ship. So the bandwidth is high, but the latency, so to speak, is, is high as well, which is not a good thing. Um, and product discovery can really get that latency down. It can mean that we ship things quicker and with higher uncertainty, we can discover, and that's the whole reason we call it product discovery, we can discover what the feature is supposed to be. The reason this all came up is because we were talking about sort of like, do we design things ahead of time? Do we have things fully spec'd out before we hand it off to engineering? And that works for some types of problems. And it's really bad for some other types of problems. If you just sit there and design a static mock-up and, and then say, great, go and ship it. But then it turns out to just not really satisfy anybody's needs. You haven't really done anything, or at least it's two months before you realize how you've made a mistake and then you can go forward. Um, bringing a little bit of lean startup thought on this, and I'll try and wrap this up quickly, is um, the difference for me between sort of the way product discovery works and the way that Scrum works is like Scrum can tolerate uh, being wrong. You know, the idea is you move quickly um, and you can react to your customer telling you how you made mistakes, et cetera. Whereas lean assumes you are wrong. You just don't know where you're wrong. And so you want to get it out as quickly as possible so you can learn what you made your mistakes on. And that, that's not a problem that you made mistakes. It's you don't know. This is a high uncertainty situation. So get something out there in front of target users, beta users, whatever, as quickly as possible so that you can find out where you are wrong. And I think that's in a lot of ways different from our approach with GitLab too is we, we're tolerant of being wrong. We have this issue tracker, we have public you know, contributions, we have all this kind of stuff, but still we're basically marching forward assuming we are right. We're, we're doing an issue and we have the next issue and we have the next issue planned out. And we're assuming that less and less. I mean, we used to assign five issues worth and we know that that's not right, but still we're basically like cross project pipelines we're doing right now. We're basically planned three releases worth and we're not listening to any feedback in the, media, in the, in the middle of that or any part of it really. We're still just assuming we're right and we're delivering it and we're tolerant of, under, you know, making, you know, whatever mistakes. And I think the big difference again with product discovery is assuming we are wrong. We want to get there as quickly as possible. We want to learn. It also does tend to mean that we have a polished, a more polished product more quickly. So anyway, that is, um, I think enough of my time. <laughs> you, Marcy, do you have something to say? Me? Uh, yes. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry, it's just my uh, my niece uh, entering here. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I, I I did it. So, Mark, just a question for you uh, about your story. Uh, were you and your team uh, just focusing on that specific uh, uh, feature during uh, that uh, week or so of work, or are you also doing something, uh, let's see, else during that? That is an excellent question. And that is probably the biggest downside of this process. Actually, there's two big downsides. Um, one is that it is basically 100% focused. Like the product manager, I would be doing other things, but the developers, the designers, they're working 100% on this one thing, um, which is great, but means you're doing no bug fixes, you're doing no maintenance, you're doing nothing else, whatever. Um, the so marty kagan who a lot of this stuff was inspired by and by the way he, so he's got this really great book um but he's got a better blog because his book is old and basically he doesn't believe in everything he wrote in his book anymore um but he's actually really a smart guy and his blog post is right on you know right on target but if you read the book like i did i'm thinking well this makes no sense this is dumb it is dumb his new stuff's awesome uh anyway um he in his book though proposed basically having two teams, like you've got your product discovery team and that's mostly about product and, and design. And you'd have like one or two engineers allocated to doing the discovery. And then when that discovery is done, you'd pass it off to the delivery team. And so you'd have a discovery team and a delivery team. And then of course the delivery team can be working on anything else in the meantime. Um, I personally never did a discovery team and a delivery team separately. Um, so I'm biased here, but I don't, I'm not even sure I think that's a good idea. His arguments were things like, well, if you do discovery, it's still just proof of concept. You'll move faster if you're not trying to write production code, but then pass it off to a delivery team that writes good production code. Um, but from my perspective, I just had one team that wrote good enough code right away. 
and we would ship it and maybe we refactor it later on. Um, but, uh, but I don't know, I, I didn't do that. But the other aspect is that potentially if you had that delivery team, then that delivery team can be working on bugs. and things. Instead, what we would do is every once in a while, we would not do a discovery sprint and we would do a bunch of bug fixing sprints or whatever. Or what you do is you'd wrap up a bunch of bug fixing into some other topic that then you would do a discovery sprint on or something. But also I would just say in practice, um, we just shipped a lot and this team and, um, and it didn't in practice be a problem, but I know that we, we do things differently here and, and we might really need more maintenance and whatever else. The other big downside to this is the synchronous communication. Um, we had at least four hours of overlap with every member of the team. Uh, in fact, in the early days, it was, you know, seven or eight hours. We had, everybody was in the same building, same physical, whatever. We would discuss something in the morning, you know, at our sort of stand up -y kind of thing. We would sync back up four hours later, and then we'd sync up again four hours later. And, um, and there was a lot of communication. As a product manager, uh, it took at least half of my time just working with the discovery stuff. So massive high bandwidth requirements from the product. The, de the, the positive side, of course, is that, and this is where a lot of this stuff was um, inspired by, was that like, you know, engineering would be like, oh, I tried to implement this thing and it's like, it's a problem. What do we want to do here? Or this spec was unclear or whatever. And so instead of just getting stuck, putting an issue, you know, comment on an issue and then going off and doing something else, you would say, okay, get the product manager and the designer together right then and we would make a decision within five minutes. That was actually before we had the product discovery sprint. That was the thing we, we precursor to all this was, if you've got a problem, basically pull the red line on the Japanese um, Kanban kind of thing, production stops, you solve the problem, then move on. Um, and that actually was incredibly powerful, frankly. It meant that our calendar time gets really reduced. It, I really don't know how the hell that's gonna work in an asynchronous globally distributed world, um, which is the big reason that I haven't been pushing this more. Um, I think it can, and it might mean that you do something like you've got your delivery team that does the normal stuff asynchronous, and then you've got a different team that at least has four hours of overlap. It might mean that you can't have globally distributed, but you can have continentally distributed. I don't know, throwing in this out there. Other comments, Mike, I see you've got some co comments. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, you actually touched on some of them whilst you were talking now. Um, like A, like I was saying, yes, please. I, I'm kind of used to working in an environment like this where you have much faster feedback loops. Um, and this is sort of proving to be somewhat painful for me. <laughs> um, I, I, but I, however, I think if this is like Everest, then we're almost in like the bottom of the Kimberley hole from a like, cultural perspective to get there. And I think there's like some very big cultural things that we, that we're not there yet. And, you know, number one is just this ability to ship something in days, not effectively six weeks. Right. Um, and that goes right the way through to production engineering. Um, and, you know, we actually do ship things in days when it comes to security releases and like all of these things. So we do do it, but it's, it seems to be the exception, not the norm. And so like, number one, we need to figure out how to change that. Um, two, you've already right, But I would push out. that just to add to that. Sorry. We should also be thinking more in terms of like shipping in hours or even minutes. Like yeah, the fact yeah, that a CI so it's, it's, takes a two hours is just ridiculous. It kills a lot of this stuff. So a great functioning team would be able to ship something within five minutes. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, but like, I'll, I'll come to some sort of points on like thoughts and action items maybe afterwards. Um, number one, that number two, you already pointed out like less async, more sync. Um, so we just had this example where we've got all of these pieces around licensing for like gitlab.com and um, EE as default. And like for the first time, we actually brought like, a lot of people together in one call and actually did a synchronous call and went through like, I actually took all of the flows out of the issues and put them into a doc. It was like, here's one doc that basically says everything. And, we, and everyone was like, okay, cool. High five. We all understand what's going on. Um, and it was great. And I, I really just in general want to, try and be a bit more synchronous. Um, but again, we'll, we'll come back to that one. The third one you also pointed out was to some extent like people's bandwidth. Um, and, you know, I, I think I'm sure the UX team and Sarah will 
you know, this, this would be unachievable right now to be able to dedicate a designer to this with the ratio that we have of developers to designers, which I don't even know if anyone knows what it is, but I'm sure it's horrendous. Um, I'm not sure that's as bad as you'd think. I mean, we, I, I've been able to do, you know, one designer for a project is enough. So the question is more like how many of these teams do you have? And if you had 20, then yes, you need 20 designers. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. We only have three of these. We've got three designers you can throw on this. I, I, okay, I, I understand that. Um, but, but I still think even now to, to dedicate a designer to something like that would, like the rest of the design pipeline would just fall through the floor, basically. Um, again, we spoke like about the ability to measure and learn. So A, like shipping something, but B, like knowing tomorrow if you ship this as a B test or, you know, if you have metrics where you can say, okay, cool, we turned this on and this happened immediately, which again, we, we currently don't have right now. Um, but what I was trying to figure out is how can we try and move towards this? Like, how can we discover product dis discovery, like actually discover the journey to it? Like, you know, are there things that we can do where, guess what, you, you know, make, and the other point I was trying to make is, are there two solves here that this thing solves? Like, number one is the process of designing something and just playing with it yourself with real data or like semi-real data or like actually just using it interactively is one thing versus like shipping it and learning that you were wrong or whatever. And like, are there ways that, you know, using review apps or, you know, something that, you know, you could do something as a team and you know what, get like maybe even everyone in the team is running that release branch and they're all running it on their machine and like the designers and the developers and the product people are able to like run that release branch on their machine. And like the next day you play with it yourself and you go like even internally, because I think sometimes even internally you, you realize that you got, you got things wrong really quickly and you can say, Hey, like let's, let's not do this. Let's change this or, or whatever. And so I'm trying to figure out like, are there sort of two or three action items that we can maybe try and take in an experiment in like a sprints or something to try and prove out some of these things and get the benefit of some of these things and then rally people behind them because getting to this world seems to be kind of insurmountable and scary. But I think if we break it down and say, okay, let's, let's practice something and like, how would we do that? Yeah. And that's one of the things I've been struggling with. Um, I mean, so frankly, you know, when I joined a year ago, whatever, this was still very top of mind. Um, but I consciously, wanted to you know, learn the GitLab way of doing things. And I wanted to embrace this stuff and not uh, break stuff. Um, and I, I don't know how to introduce this slowly. Um, and I'm not even sure that I should, because we have a different culture and we have a different way of doing things and just forcing this on, in fact, could very well break things. So I've been here a year now. I feel like I've got you know, a pretty good handle on velocity and whatever, and I can always still improve. But um, I, one of the things I will say up front is that the biggest thing that the product discovery sprint solved for me and my team before was velocity, but that's not actually the challenger. We have velocity. We're, we're shipping great stuff. So I, like, it's like, okay, well, if that's not what's for, then why, why am I even considering this? And for me, it is stuff like wall clock time, um, polish, and uh, like, you know, to some extent, the embarrassment of shipping RC1 or RC5 and then being like, what the hell? This just doesn't even work because no product manager got a chance to test it until it got up on GitLab.com. Or, you know, at most he tested it with some fake data or something like that. But even that, we just don't even really, I don't get to see it until it's on .com. Um, and, uh, and then just the whole customer validation cycle, like, how many times do we ship something and, um, and it's a total waste of time? It's not often, but it does happen occasionally. And, you know, I'm just going to throw up cycle analytics. Like, and I'm not aware of anybody using it. It's got big bugs, actually, that I'm pretty sure stop anybody from using portions of it that we've just never even fixed. But because nobody's using it, like it, nobody's even submitting issues to fix the issues because nobody cares. Why did we ship it? Well, we shipped it because we had an idea that we wanted to fulfill and we just blindly went through. And that's exactly the scenario where like, we could have validated that earlier or, or devaluated or whatever the hell, we, you know, whatever, disproved the, the hypothesis earlier. Or we could have said, well, once we hit the customers, 
Maybe we could have just twisted it a little bit and it would have actually been valuable. At this point, I genuinely don't know what it would take to make psychoanalytics valuable. I believe there's some value in it, but we're not, ex like the execution is, is not. It didn't deliver the value that we, it didn't deliver on the hypothesis. But again, most of the stuff we ship, it's pretty awesome. Um, most of the stuff is great. And most of the stuff we do get good feedback on. If it's a used feature, we will get feedback and we will eventually ship it. And it just takes a little longer. And again, if I look at wall clock time over the last year, I'm incredibly proud of what my teams have shipped. I, would, I don't want to do anything to slow that down, but I'm just imagining like, okay, this is what I could do at Heroku where we actually at that point in time had a really low vo velocity and this resulted in a 10X improvement. So what can we learn from that? And like, what, you know, could we squeeze out another two or five X from our teams today? Like, can we raise the bar even more and deliver even faster with better results? And I think we can. Um, you hit on this, I'll just add, because I wrote it down there as well, but like a couple of the tactical things that make this viable are a, a CD, you know, deployment structure to .com. Like I don't mind necessarily if we never get to EE or CE customers. We've got enough representation in .com that I think we can learn that way. Um, but I think we need feature flags and we need a beta group. And we need to be able to then feature flag in the beta group, which is primarily the thing. But also, as you pointed out, even just using it ourselves, hell, we're all, well, not we all, but we're all developers. Um, and we do learn a lot by testing internally. And that was one of the other things, like, I, I do believe the rhetoric about, like, you've got to get customers using it. But the reality is, like, if you use it yourself first, you can knock out 80% of the problems with it. And then, you know, frankly, again, at Heroku, we we expect like people would say, or my mentor would tell me like if you ship ten things and two of them are great successes and the rest you delete, that's okay. That's a good ratio, one in five. But in reality, we would ship nine out of ten things. Like only one tenth of the time did we ship something we actually regretted shipping or that we'd want to change. Um, we just didn't have that many failures. And I'm not trying to be arrogant or whatever. It's just that. Maybe there's a whole bunch of low hanging fruit or because we were a developer platform and we were developers, we knew what people would like, or I don't know, whatever. Maybe we just picked things that we were pretty confident in, which is again, one of the reasons I think that GitLab is doing fine. Like nine out of 10 things, or maybe even higher are in fact valuable. So validating early just to see whether the idea is valuable or not, is not actually the most important thing. Um, and again, with our feedback loop, like sometimes we'd be frustrated because we'd ship things and all we basically get a thumbs up. And it's like, okay, then, you know, why did I bother with all this just to get thumbs up? But not always. Sometimes you'd get some much better clarity, uh, you know, from the, from the group. So anyway, so shipping better products, get, raising the quality, shipping faster, I think is important. For me, it's also sort of about momentum. Um, shipping things within a week feels awesome, frankly. And it means that then the next week you can continue to deliver on that or you move on something else, but you, you deliver everything really, really closely. Whereas shipping something over this period of three months um, feels slower, but it also means like, I don't know, you just keeping that momentum going for three months is harder. It's far worse if you're trying to do six months. So GitLab's got a whole bunch of other people beat. But anyway, so feature flags, beta group, and a, and a CD process, I think are some of the requirements. And those things I'm pretty positive would be worthwhile no matter what. So one proposal then would be like, all right, well, let's work towards that. Let's get CD working. Let's get .com working so that we don't have to have an RC to get .com changed, that we can have something behind a feature flag that we have confidence in, that will have no impact on anybody except for internal users and beta users. And everybody else is using, you know, what they think of as the, the last, you know, published release. But .com is deployed daily or hourly or whatever. And, um, and again, that's valuable for other reasons. But if we do that, then maybe we can open it up to doing more proof of concept stuff. Another thing um, is, uh, I don't know how to phrase this, but proof of concept with production data. Um, I know we've had this discussion about from an API perspective, but um, one of the things that did happen to improve our velocity was the visual design, the visual interface of Heroku completely used the API, the public API, which meant that I could spin up review apps of the UI that touch production data. Um, because it didn't want just the production data, it was the production API, which meant that at some point, once we had review apps as a product, that was actually how we did beta tests of radical design changes. We didn't have to even worry about feature flags. We just had a review app. 
And we would literally send the review up link to our beta list and say, try this out. Um, it turned out to be awesome. And in fact, if we had that from the beginning, we may never have even invested in feature flags now that I think about it. Um, review apps alone were that. But also before then, we would just do proof of concepts. So we'd stand up a whole new interface that looked different, um, but touched again production data. So I could go in and do real things, but on a totally shell new app that we would throw away. Ended up actually doing that out of necessity um, because we would do these starter projects with people and we didn't, we couldn't legally necessarily use the starter project code in a shipped product. We didn't pay them and there was this weird legal stuff. But if we did proof of concepts that we'd throw away, then it would be fine. I would at least the theory. Um, but it turned out that we did a few great things. Uh, like review ups itself was actually a proof of concept throwaway app for a while. And then several months later, we finally picked it up and then rewrote the whole thing, of course, mm -hmm. and implemented it. But that proof of concepts might be another tool that make this viable. So, so, so we have, so I think also maybe we should move on quickly to give Sarah some time because we <laughs> take a long meeting. Um, but uh, so just to sort of big up my uh, brethren, uh, Andrew and Danielle. So we had all the stuff at, at Gitter and I actually found out recently secretly that Andrew basically implemented feature flags um, in GitLab. So we already have it. Um, it's just, it's super primitive at the moment. All you can do is funnel a percentage of traffic through it. Um, and in the work that we're doing with Sarah on the navigation, we're actually gonna be being able to opt in to it. So, and also the, the, the stuff that we use, we will be able to add like, hey, turn this whole group on. So you can take a, the GitLab, anyone in this group and turn it on for that group or turn it on for this user or whatever. So A, we're moving towards that and we'll be able to do something better with that. And then B, Danielle um, has implemented uh, Canary deployments on GitLab with like full data, basically. So we can basically do some of that. So in this world where we have some of these things, like maybe we can start making some progress there. But for me, the big, big one is the one that you list last there, which is CD, where like, hey, can we make a canary server like point to a feature branch, like effectively like review apps or make it point, like, like me, I want to get into this world where GitLab.com is like develop or some branch or whatever. And then actually we only choose to cut it every six weeks or four weeks into a release or we, and we, or we don't pick things into it. And that's like how we get there. But I'd love to like pick up on how, how we can go about like taking a project through this um, and getting certainly production um, on board and just like doing a, a proof of concept of this and, and, and winning um, by proving to people and sharing it in the team meeting or in something where we say, hey, we, guess what, we did this and this is the metric that we moved from A to B as a result of this and we shipped it in one week. And if you prove success like that, I think you'll be able to bring people on board and change some of the cultural um, sacred goats, if you like, cows, something. Right. And I think that the path forward here could be to focus on what you just talked about, like the feature flags, the CD, everything else, which we all, I think, are on board with anyway, without attacking, say, the synchronous part. We could still do asynchronous whatever, and maybe that means we're not going to be able to do five iterations in a week. But if we can still do one a week and get it out there into customers, or for that matter, like even just the simplest thing of like, having a beta tester use something mid-cycle so that by the time we launch it in a release, we've had the beta testers use it for two weeks. Like that alone would be a huge milestone, right? And then if we can shorten that up and be like, okay, but then we actually iterate three times before the release. Like, yeah, now we're just, you know, getting crazy. At some point, sure, maybe we'll be iterating 20 times before release, but you know, but we could still probably tackle it and maybe we'll hit some threshold where asynchronous and synchronous becomes a problem, but let's defer that and focus on just the CD part is important, which by the way, since we're selling CD to people, like the fact that we're not using it is a problem already. So like, that's a good idea. And frankly, if we can come up with a great way to do CD plus a release cycle, I think that's an awesome topic for our customers. Cause you know, whatever people, some of the folks are struggling with the same kind of thing. Um, but anyway, having some CD and review apps and everything else. Yeah. If, if I could have a review app for the thing alone, if I could have a review app for our features that use production data, um, that would be fantastic um, because I'd be able to see stuff earlier. That, and that's a precursor to them being able to iterate five times in a week.
So, so again, just in the sense of time, I'll try and go fast, but I, I think um, I, obviously feature flags and review apps and all stuff is all amazing. But the one thing that, that I think for me in particular for like new features, which would be really helpful is I think sort of along the lines of less async, more async like to try and maybe in the world of GitLab have like more focus. Cause like one thing I've seen is that you'll have like the backend team working on the backend API, the front end team working the front end API, the backend team is working on tests, the front end team is using mock data. And then like, like a week before you're ready to actually like, you know, sort of get into reviews maybe is when like the merge between the front end back end happens. And like, it's super scary, stressful and like really risky. Um, so I, I wonder if we can, I, I, I don't know how you structure this, but try and maybe have like a focused area, like, okay, so this is a marquee feature of this release for this team. For me, this is obviously small, so it's easy to do. Um, but maybe you can be like, look, you know, we're gonna try and focus on this feature for two weeks, see how far we get, and try and have like, maybe like a common branch we both work against. That way, like, you know, we both can see we're using real data, um, like the product and design can click on, can like check out the branch and have both functioning parts. Um, like, and, and then maybe you can try and solve it that way and just be like, look, you know, don't work on bugs, don't work on other stuff, just like drive towards this and, and really try and have an, as early as possible, like a complete end to end functioning thing, even if it breaks and even if it's fragile, I think that'd be helpful as well. Even, you know, without, I, of course, again, the feature flies and beta groups also super helpful, but that I think would also be interesting to try and have some discipline there and see if we can do that and try and solve this sort of hairy, risky back end front end thing, which it doesn't seem to have a great answer for it now. Yeah, I think that's another symptom of you know the same kind of problem that we're having debates about whether we should work in the same branch or not is just kind of crazy to me. Um, we've also got yeah, we've had lots of disconnects at the end. We've had lots of things where only one side like it's worse like oh front end is ready to merge but back end isn't and we push a really like what or whatever. Um, I'm sorry, I am going to try and respect time here, but a couple of other really interesting things that we learned about too in this process is why whereas um you know when you go into stuff usually it's like okay well product they're responsible for this and designers responsible for that and engineering is responsible for this and and everybody has these rigid roles um one of the things about scrum that we sort of did take forward was that we're all just on a team and we're all responsible for shipping something and in fact we get zero credit for like doing our part but not shipping like it's irrelevant if we've got the design done or we've got the product spec'd out or we got the back end. But if we don't ship, we don't ship and we get zero. Um, what that means though in practice was that I would hire for, but people would be like designers and developers would talk together and collaborate on things. But it also meant that it was a back and forth. And if the developer said, well, what you've come up with is really hard, this other thing would be much easier. And you'd be like, oh, well, yeah, do that then because it's, 90% you know, is good, or maybe it's even better, but just an alternate that we hadn't considered. And I feel like I'm having that debate on one of the issues right now with Dimitri, not to throw him under the bus, but like we're coming up with this elaborate design and he believes it's better. And I'm like, but if we could just kill that, it'd be simpler and we could probably ship it this month because I'm really worried we're not going to ship. And how much do you need to stick to this is the better way versus let's ship and we all get zero if we don't ship. And I just feel like when you do throw everybody in, and it helps again if it's synchronous, but the team part is the most important part. The team's all pitching together and the goal is for us to ship as quickly as possible. And in fact, the other flip side of this is you know that you've got five iterations in a week. So the first iteration doesn't have to be great. Ship for the tiniest kernel of the thing and then improve as you go and trust that you'll get to a beautiful design in the end. But if you always start with this beautiful design and you start that from day one, it just puts this high bar and it might be more efficient, but in practice it's not because a lot of times it means you don't ship that release and you skip it and you, you go to the next release. And then that means you've delayed learning and you've delayed customers getting value. And it probably means you've delayed every other feature from there and it all ships down by one. Whereas if you made a few sacrifices in the complexity of your design and got it out, you, we'd all be better off. Um, I firmly believe that anyway. Um, anyway, really exciting topic. I, I haven't heard from Victor or Fabio or Sarah on this. Do you have anything you want to add? Uh, I'll, I'll add something really quickly, just uh, more observation, no solution yet. Cause I think all the solutions have been said. Um, there's a lot of challenges, so I won't comment on those. Um, one thing I don't think that was explicitly touched on, but something that I sort of thought about more in the past week working with uh, related issues, which will, you will see in the retro because it missed shipping for two releases. Um, which is terrible, 
Uh, but one thing that I've been thinking about is that every new feature we create, there's a huge uh, cost of maintaining it forever. So that's what I've been telling people. Like uh, Sarah was on a call when we, when we talked about another feature with Chris and I told them that adding is easy and taking away is impossible because a bazillion people will descend on an issue and complain to you if you take away something. But if you never add it, they can't complain about you taking it away. So every time we add a feature, whether it's the code complexity, the product complexity, support team, security, it, it, there's a bazillion of things that um, the cost is super high. So that just all goes into everything that we've said, but something that I've been you know, meditating on a little bit more um, from sort of the other side of the coin where it's a cost and it's not, it, it, everything you've, everybody's been saying is correct. But in addition to that, there's a cost of maintaining it. So when I looked at related issues, when I looked at a native group milestones, adding that, all those extra features, I have to jam my brain with all that extra context every time I think of a new feature because it's now part of our product. Um, and so uh, I, I hope that, you know, obviously product managers, everybody understands that, but I hope everybody at GitLab also understands that. And I've been sharing uh, Yobes a uh, little short blog post about everybody's a product owner and not a, and there's no product owners. So I want everybody to think like that as well so that when they're designing or when they're coding, it's not just for the scope of that issue, but every, every decision you make from a design or code perspective, it has ramifications, you know, forever on GitLab. I'm done. And I added something in the, in, <laughs> in the handbook to that effect, actually, like in two sentences, not, not, it didn't take two minutes to read. It'll take you 30 seconds or 10 seconds to read. So you can read it in the MVC section of the handbook if you care. Yeah, thank you. I want just to give you my feedback on this but very shortly. I really love to try this uh, product discovery, and, but I'm at the same time I'm scared about the fact that uh, we have also, we had a discussion about uh, the, as, uh, that we want to fix a lot of bugs, uh, existing regressions and so on. So uh, I, I think that if we put in this, mind, in this uh, mindset, uh, every time we will see that there is something more say, important, so fixing bugs and so on, and so we are not able to move forward with the product discovery. So it, what just came up to my mind, maybe it's just something stupid, but uh, we can try maybe as, as a test to pick up uh, just uh, one little thing that could be the feature that we really want to, uh, the, to deliver in a, in, in a release or just uh, the most uh, uh, simple or what, whatever. And uh, maybe focus, we have a four weeks uh, uh, release cycle. Just focus one week, uh, all the team, uh, just for that uh, without, uh, <coughs> sorry, without any other interruption. So it's clear to, every, to everyone that uh, we have to focus just on that. Maybe not all the team, because maybe you just need the one front end, one back end, uh, one design uh, and uh, the, the product uh, person. And uh, after this week, uh, that feature will be, uh, let's say, uh, left alone. So if ready, okay. If not ready, it was an experiment, so it's fine. And uh, we can uh, have other three weeks uh, for, let's say, the uh, old way of working so we are uh, sure that you can uh, deliver something we can release uh, without uh, any problems at most uh, we are spending one week uh, for this experiment maybe this uh, can be the way to test it without impacting too much and without uh, having the let's say the the, the blocker of saying uh, if we fail with this experiment the next release will have uh, uh, nothing in it no maybe because i really want to try it it's really interesting, but I, it's to figure out which is the best way to find it uh, and to try it without uh, breaking uh, all the release of the month. This is my idea. Um, I, this is your guys' meeting, so don't ever worry about time. <laughs> I'm just an interloper. Um, I've worked this way as well, uh, Mark. I'm very familiar with this. I love this. Um, I am used to doing a lot more designing in code than in sketch. Um, I find it painful and slow. Uh, and while I love the freedom of async, I do um, find it excruciating to spend a very, very long time on one issue. Um, I've only been here a month and it already feels like three. 
Uh, <laughs> there's some issues that, you know, it just seems like it's moving mountains to try to get feedback and try to get it going along and, and to get people to um, at least come to some kind of, uh, if not a consensus, some decision, right? Um, so whatever we can do on UX to help with this, um, I, can, I can say that we're all in. It's something that we talk about a lot. Um, design is struggling for collaboration, struggling to find ways to work together more because it's something that uh, we're used to and that we want to do. So um, I'm, I'm in for sure. Uh, and Mark, you had a question. As far as I know, yes, I know Tori is, I am. Uh, Dimitri and Chris, I think, Pedro, I'm pretty sure. I know he was talking about taking care of little issues on his own. Hazel is the only one I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to find out. Um, and my, my thing on that is um, I never push designers to do that. I think that it's good if they can. Um, but I know plenty of designers that just don't want to, and I don't want them to feel like they're not valuable because they can't. Um, so um, I just say that, you know, if they can, great. If not, if that's not something they want to do, then there are other areas they can help out in. Um, well, that's good to hear because, um, just frankly, I tried this at a different company and it didn't work so well because the designers weren't hired for that. And so zero of the designers could work in code. And um, it meant a lot less collaboration. Yeah. Uh, in practice, one of the things is like by the third iteration, the designer is going to say, hey, can you just shove this over a pixel or whatever? And it sucks to make a mock-up to show somebody to do something where it's like, I'm just going to edit the CSS for you and just do that. I refuse. I won't do that. But uh, yeah. And a lot of times what I'll do is when, when in the teams that I've been working on where I'm doing design and I'm doing development, because typically I would do both, then the initials were in sketch so that we could kind of talk through and we go from wireframes. But as soon as it, it left, it, as soon as it lived in code somewhere, I worked in the code because it's, it doesn't make any sense to be doing all these crazy mock-ups and exporting out. And then you just have more crap to keep track of. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in for sure. Uh, I just wanted to add, uh, an FYI on our new UX research cycle. Um, Sarah just came back from vacation. She was gone for the first like three weeks that I was here. So <laughs> it was a little tough to, to get moving on, on, uh, what's being done for research and how we've been doing things. Um, I did find, and so my big thing has been what are we using for statistics, metrics? How are we measuring things? How are we getting baselines? What are we measuring against? Um, I've been looking at OKRs and when I, I'm used to doing any type of OKRs, I'm always listing my success metrics. Like what is the goal and how are we measuring that goal? So it's been a little weird for me um, trying to quantify that or get some kind of uh, information on that. I did find an issue where that Allison had created a while ago about PIWIC or Pickwick or some something you guys have been using um, and that that isn't really very helpful. Um, Sarah filled me in and said that I can check it out, but she doesn't think it's been kept up to date. Uh, there's some talk about using Prometheus, but that's not something that can happen until the end of the summer. So all I have left right now is to continue working with Sarah and have her do uh, traditional research methods without um, real time metrics. Um, and that's what this uh, UX research cycle is about. She's planning on starting on the 21st. Um, I invite everyone to comment on the issue and add feedback. Um, what I'm trying, what we did or what I did was I went through all the current UX research issues, kind of did a quick spreadsheet just to say this is, you know, priority wise where it's at. And some of them weren't even re UX research at this point. Uh, and then I went through, I actually went through all the uh, issues uh, with the UX on them in uh, CE. There were like 900 and something, uh, one by one. And I looked at each, which is really good to, to understand like what's going on out there. Um, and I, I created a couple of boards to better track. And what I'm looking to do is really get baseline stats on areas that have a lot of issues, that seem to have a lot of problems that people are talking about. Um, if you disagree with that, please chime in and let me know. If you have an area that you think really needs research that we're not calling out, let me know. Um, uh, and that's pretty much it. That's all I wanted to say about that. I figure most of that could be done inside of that issue. You could take a look there. I don't have to talk at you about it. <laughs> Unlike um, Mark. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> can, I, um, can I comment um, around this, Sarah? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I was thinking while I was uh, in, on vacations, um, 
that may be um, a, 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 a problem solver we had, uh, we could have with uh, a little bit uh, of UX front end and back end is uh, if we could find a way to link the documentation on each you know, part of GitLab from the UI to the documentation. For example, a two tip that you define what that thing is and from there you link, there's like a learn more link or something like that, that links directly to the documentation. By doing so, I think we should, uh, we would improve the UX by um, making it easier to find out what that stuff is, what it does and where do I find documentation around it. Uh, does that make sense to you guys, you know, or, you know, something like that. Um, some, probably something that we could enable and disable because um, who is already used to GitLab wouldn't, you know, uh, want to see, you know, a tube tip for every hover, you know, that you do would be like uh, crazy. But if we, you know, have some kind of enable, disable would be like, you know, uh, what do you guys think about it? Uh, I, I agree. We, I think we actually have maybe two or three issues out there. Um, they're all kind of tangentially related. One is about onboarding for new features. So anytime we do a release, there is a dismissible, uh, this is what's new. Um, we haven't really fleshed that out into how, what that would look like and what the experience would be. Um, but that's one of them. And then another is adding tooltips and to, links to documentation. Um, and there's, I think, a third issue. And then there was another one that we closed because it was too much like the others. Um, so uh, I will try to find those and link you to them so, so that you could definitely give feedback on those. Um, but that's something that I agree. We, we definitely should be doing more of to help people uh, discover those features. Thank you. Yeah, I think the first one I know, uh, but the other ones I, I don't. Uh, any inputs from, you know, you guys, uh, PMs, about it? One thing I'll add is my gut reaction to uh, documentation is that if the UX depends on reading documentation to understand it, then we made a mistake in the UX. And that's not entirely true, of course, but it's a broad generalization that, you know, like, things should be relatively obvious. Um, a good UX shouldn't need documentation, let's say, in general. There are some really complicated subjects, like how the hell do you do CI/CD and the GitLab CI YAML is not going to be self-explanatory. But that actually alone has its own things that it should be self-explanatory. We should have a nice visualizer here for it, whatever. But until we do that, the point of the documentation is all we can do. But hopefully, in general, my point is we should be the UI should be self-explanatory. I agree, but I think exploring that might point us to places that aren't. So like if we're sitting there saying, hey, a learn more would be good here. That's an area where we're like, whoa, wait a minute. Why do they need to learn more? Like it shouldn't be that hard. So I see it both ways. I, I totally agree. And I think that we could probably eliminate a lot of really bad UX decisions <laughs> pretty quickly by going through those issues. All right, well, there's nothing else on the topic. I think that wraps it up. We're a couple of minutes late, so we should probably close it up anyway. All right, thanks everyone. Um, <clears throat> I think as far as action items go, we should probably just you know put things uh, think about this a little bit, product discovery, whatever, and then maybe talk about specific proposals next time or any other time. Um, but I at least wanted to plant the seed and have people thinking about it. All right, ciao. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks.